So people think that you're somehow born a great speaker. John Kennedy, born with charisma. Martin Luther King, born a charismatic speaker. Martin Luther King Jr. received a C in public speaking. Imagine if you or I were up there in front of 250,000 people. What would we be thinking? Uh, thanks for coming today. We need to pass this legislation. Thanks a lot. <laughs> We'd be nervous. Now, I work with people all the time. They come to me for one-on-one -on -one presentation training. They get nervous. So they stand up to give their first speech, and they do this. This, when you stand like this, you're telling everybody you have to go to the restroom. <laughs> oh, but I don't know what to do with my hands. Let me stand like this. Welcome, Gomer Pyle, United States Marine Corps. <laughs> you are. I'm afraid I might fall down, <laughs> so I better hold on to this. And do you know who else uses hands? All of you. I have been working with people for 22 years, coaching them on how to be a better presenter. I've yet to have someone come up who moves his hands too much. <laughs> great world leaders, great local leaders, great communicators at every level use the power of story. A story is simply a way of taking the abstract message point you want to talk about and bringing it down to the ground where you're talking about a real person a real problem, a real conversation, and that makes it more memorable, more interesting for your audience. People don't say, oh, I remember that bullet point slide with 25 different numbers and 27 different rows. That's not what people remember. They remember the stories. If someone can't tell you specifically, I remember this story, I remember this set of facts, you now have empirical evidence that you did a lousy job of presenting. Because if people can't tell you messages, what have you accomplished? OK. One of the problems a lot of us have when we're speakers is we're thinking, uh-oh, what if I make a mistake? A little secret, great speakers make mistakes too. The difference, they just don't tell anyone. <laughs> That's considered by many historians the greatest speech of the 20th century. He made a mistake. If he's allowed to make a mistake for the greatest speech of the 20th century, I think we need to cut ourselves some slack. But notice what he didn't do. He didn't stumble on a word and go, <clears throat> he didn't beat himself up. For the most part, audiences don't recognize our mistakes. They don't notice our mistakes. They notice our own reactions to our mistakes. It's okay to make a mistake. Just don't tell anyone. So much of being a great speaker is about being conversational. That's not hard to do as far as learning a brand new skill like learning the violin. Great communicators know that it's no different than talking to one person. It's the same thing about talking slow that I show with Martin Luther King. If you've ever talked to one child in a slow, persistent way, you have the skills it takes to speak in front of 400,000 people. The problem for most of us and why we're not great speakers, is we get on stage and we start acting. Days of, my fellow Americans, I'm here today to tell you about... Those days are over. You don't have to project. The second you project, what you do is you flatten out your voice. You flatten out the range. In normal conversation, you can be a little louder, a little softer, a little faster, a little slower. But when you're projecting, all of a sudden, everything starts to sound the same, and it's like a Chinese water torture test, and you're in pain. <laughs> so don't do it. Great leaders, when they're communicating, understand that there is power in simplicity. Quite often, the smarter the person, the smaller the words when you're giving a presentation. I'm convinced people are a little bit insecure, and they want to sound smart. So hey, if I use a bunch of big words, Everybody will think I'm smart, right? It's not how it works. Confident leaders realize their first goal is making sure your message is understood by this audience member right here. Winston Churchill would pride himself being able to give complicated speeches on foreign policy, never using a word with more than two syllables. And he would often talk about the idea that the eye can process information, can read big words, long sentences, in a way the ear cannot. Great leaders understand, when you speak, you're speaking for the ear. 
What else makes a speaker compelling? It's not just having the most facts, the most bullet points. There is this passion here. All of you are passionate. But somehow, when we climb up the stairs and get in front of an audience, we lose that passion. We've got to retain the passion if we're going to connect. Giuliani, in my mind, is a perfect example of the power of passionate speaking. When 9-11 happened, he wasn't reading notes. He looked right at us. Everything he said was a combination of the intellect and the heart. Great leaders know that. Don't be afraid to show your passion. Any passion you have is going to be a lot more interesting and a lot more captivating than sort of standing up and looking down at notes and, well, as you can see on my next slide. I'm sorry about the slide. I know you can't read the print, but <laughs> it looks good in real life. It's very difficult to read in front of people and do it well. But what you can't see from that clip is Churchill would read his speeches out loud for hour after hour after hour. And he would do it in his bathtub. Once his servant went in and said, Sir, are you okay? What's going on in there? I'm addressing the House of Commons. Don't bother me. He would practice for hours after hours to get comfortable with it, to build his relationship with those words. Don't be afraid to move. Movement can be good. In part, notice when I move over here, you sort of have to move your eyeballs a little. So much of the problem speakers have is our audiences are sleeping. So anything we can do to create a little more variation. For most of us, it actually is easier moving a little when we speak, as long as it's not too rhythmic. I've had CEOs and other clients give a presentation, and they start doing this. I'm like, what time is the square dance? <laughs> so movement is good. The problem with getting behind a lectern is this is a way for me to protect myself. Because if you think I'm really awful and you're going to start throwing rotten vegetables, <laughs> I've got a place of dodging. I happen to believe that this is the training wheels of the speaker world. Try to get away from behind the lectern. If nothing else, you can go like this. People can see you gesture, they can see you move, and you can still talk. I also have a dream for an improbable quest. It's the quest to eliminate the world of boring speakers, a bad PowerPoint. Here's the reality. Most speakers aren't very good. And I urge you, take every opportunity you have to speak seriously, prepare. Practice, hold yourself to high standards. When you're looking at speakers in the future, when you're looking at leaders you respect and admire, don't just listen to the message. Analyze every single thing they're doing. There's nothing any of these people did. There's nothing any of these men or women did that you can't do. All of you have the power to be great speakers. Everyone in your organization has the power to be an effective communicator every single time you open your mouth. Thanks.